I'm Jake Cusack. I'm a managing partner at Cross Boundary. Um, we're a firm focused on bringing private capital into underserved markets. Um, we have eight offices uh, in, in Africa um, and uh, have been working there for about the last uh, decade. Um, and so excited uh, for this opportunity. Um, to my right, I have Ryan w Wagner, uh, head of infrastructure at CDC. Uh, my colleague, uh, Marilia uh, Martins, uh, associate principal at Cross Boundary based in London, but ha having done significant work uh, in Africa. Saad Sheikh of TLG Capital. And virtually, we have Hubert Danzo coming in from uh, Johannesburg. Thanks for joining us. Um, the bios are in the program, so I think we'll just get uh, right into it. I think maybe as an opening question uh, for everyone, um, you know, what is the state of the infrastructure landscape? Uh, it's been a while since we've had the opportunity to be in person and, and talk about it. Um, I think we've seen some real challenges in the, in the private equity asset class and the withdrawal of some players uh, from the market, challenging uh, net returns for sort of private equity growth capital, perhaps a bit better picture uh, in the infrastructure space. And then we're seeing this rush, uh, relatively speaking, in, into venture capital. Um, and it getting easier for, for uh, venture-backed companies uh, to raise capital. Um, so curious, you know, from all of your perspectives, what are you seeing? Obviously, the infrastructure gap remains. What's needed to close that gap? And maybe start with you, Ryan. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jake. Um, yeah, pleasure to be here. It's great to be at a live conference. <laughs> yeah. um, I think, yeah, over the past few years, we've seen a kind of a stark change in the infrastructure fund space as well as the, the broader landscape. And I think. Part of that has been this shift from kind of core infrastructure to other areas like venture capital, like further deepening into the renewable space. Uh, so I think we, ha we have started to see some shifts, especially within, within Africa, and especially on the fund side, managers becoming more specialized, uh, more uh, or deepening their skill sets a, a, a bit uh, further into the market. I think returns, as you mentioned, uh, have been an issue, and we have sort of seen a retreat from some commercial investors or global investors in, into African infrastructure. Hopefully that's just a temporary thing and hopefully they do return and some things like climate will attract them. I think we're seeing quite a movement in the, the climate space from a, a lot of investors. I think the, the other conference in the UK that's going on right now is probably talking a lot about, a lot about this and hopefully we see more capital uh, from climate investors going into, into Africa. Great. Really? Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, I think I broadly agree with, with, with Ryan, and I think um, if, if, we, if we take a, a look at kind of the, glob, the global um, funding, especially when, when you look at, at SDG, in the SDG space, I mean, um, just to bring a few numbers in, 20% um, um, of the global, of, of the global uh, asset, uh, of global assets of the 379 trillion dollars in, in global assets are, are in, in emerging markets only. So if you move 1.1% of, of, of the additional number, you're able to, to close that funding gap. And um, you're seeing within the, the ESG space a, a, a boom as well in, in, in the growth of that, that capital supply. So um, from 2020 to 2021, you, you've grown that, especially in the, in the public market space. Um, over 50 percent, but then if you if you zoom into into Africa, um, then you, you you have you, you they only the continent only represents a very tiny portion. So um, two percent of, of all the cumulative uh, green bond issuance in um, in the uh, in in from from 20 uh, sorry 2012 to 2019 is African based, and you only have 24 issuers across the entire continent. Um, but, but as um, Olusola said in, in, their opening, in, in his opening remarks, um, you're seeing, you are seeing sort of a record fundraising in, in, in the private side as well. So um, 10 new vehicles in Africa um, and, and new capital flowing in. So, I, I'm not. Um, I might be a bit controversial, but I'm not. I'm not sure if it's it's if it's really kind of a, a a question of of supply of capital, or if it is a question of of really having the deal flow to to absorb that. And so, how do you how do you 
bring new green projects into, and, and I'm focusing on, on green infrastructure, but um, how do you bring that in um, and, and make those, those projects actually ready, to, ready to, to be viable, right? So you have, you have the pipeline, but is that pipeline ready to, to absorb that, that capital flow in? Yeah, I would agree with that. Sad? Uh, yeah, no, it's a huge landscape. Firstly, pleasure to be here and in person. Um, huge landscape and something that we've seen getting more and more entrenched in. So I represent a, a private credit fund, so might be slightly uh, outnumbered here, but what we're seeing is the growth of uh, credit on the continent as an asset class, really supporting all types of, um, all types of investment opportunities including um, the venture side, including late stage, et cetera. So wherever you see an investment opportunity, they, there is an angle of credit there. So what we've, what we, uh, what the way that I've, I'll spin this question, Jake, if you allow me, is the, um, is the angle that credit brings, but also the opportunity that we've identified through local uh, currency credit plays, um, uh, focused on infrastructure. For example, in Nigeria, and. Um, InfraCredit was mentioned, I think those organizations are great, um, but sometimes they tend to crowd out private capital. So I think there's an opportunity for both to work together. I've worked with InfraCredit on a number of occasions and they've come back to me and said, well, can you lend in 9% in Naira? And obviously my job would, job would drop, right? 9% in Naira is negative yield in, in dollars. How do I do that when my, my return profile is double digits? Um, so, so, you know, th th there needs to be that comfort between these multilateral organizations and private capital to work together. That collaboration hasn't kicked in yet. Um, the individual silos, but I think that's just the nature of the market. It's a question of maturity. Um, so I do think that what we're doing I in healthcare through um, whether infrastructure <coughs> of manufacturing or distribution or retail, um, whether infrastructure in terms of uh, rural telephony, which was also mentioned that we're looking at. Um, all of those infrastructure projects require an element of credit, but well thought through credit. Uh, an element of local currency, an element of um, 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 <coughs> dollar denominated. Um, so all of that kind of works really well. Uh, we've, for example, supported our infrastructure plays with um, a technical assistance as well to provide um, sol solar energy or to provide uh, other infrastructure opportunities that the DFI support with, like, for example, Ryan, I'm sure we'll talk about it because um, we took technical assistance from the CDC and from Sweat Fund uh, to put solar panels in two of our healthcare clinics. So I think it's, it's a meeting of minds and kind of bringing all the uh, players in the market together uh, to uh, broaden the pie. I think that's what needs to happen. And a great point that um, you mentioned, um, that um, I think there is that question, are there enough um, fundable projects out there, right? And I think there are, they're just not in the full. So we all need to kind of collaborate and just bring them out so that capital, the right capital can go to the right projects. The right multilaterals can then start working with, uh, uh, with like-minded infra um, infrastructure investors. So I think there's a, there's a meeting of minds that still is, uh, is the need of the hour, what I would say, Jake. Great, thank you very much, Sad. Hubert, over to you. <coughs> uh, thank you, thank you very much, and uh, greetings everybody from Glasgow, where we're immersed in the uh, COP26 uh, discussions, but I think, again, very, very relevant to the uh, points that have been sort of uh, introduced in the opening and, and, and of course, echoed and uh, built upon by my, my fellow panelists. Look, I think we're, we're, you know, we're hearing that the next uh, 1,000 unicorns are going to come from green tech. And the, you know, the opportunity for GPs to reposition themselves to, to these and other market transformation opportunities, in my view, is very significant in an African market that's going to need it in the region of about $3 trillion of investment capital by 2030 for nationally determined <coughs> contribution uh, projects and transactions, essentially the projects that governments have undertaken and committed to fulfill their you know, commitments within the, the Paris um, Agreement. Additionally, we're sort of seeing the fund of funds approach growing in popularity, but we think that that's sort of being overtaken, at least in discussion terms, uh, by you know, the whole structures around uh, permanent capital vehicles uh, for infrastructure, particularly like the ones used by IFM uh, investors in Australia. 
you know, this is becoming, you know, the, the, a real discussion, particularly between asset owners and some of the forward-looking GPs. So we're seeing players on the continent doing this uh, more and more as a strategy to address the climate crisis. And we think that the climate crisis is the opportunity compounded and coupled with the sort of post-pandemic economic response and strategy. We think this represents an opportunity for, for forward-looking GPs to really uh, reposition their offering in this respect. And, and I think that's gonna become a growing and increasing, uh, increasing trend. We're also seeing that asset owners will also be uh, asking GPs and this is a big conversation that's happening right here in Glasgow right now, where the asset owners are increasingly being looked at to you know, drive and play a leadership role in the infrastructure space, particularly green infrastructure. So we, we anticipate that GPs are increasingly going to be asked to decarbonize uh, their portfolios um, and effectively address scope one and scope two emissions commitment. And, and that's where a lot of the companies and the investors are, are taking this conversation at the moment. But we know that that, you know, decarbonize our own portfolio, decarbonize our own supply chain is, yes, scope one and scope two. But combined, that only really addresses about 30 percent of the emissions, um, you know, challenge that we actually have. But LPs, um, you know, are increasingly looking to reward, um, you know, exceptional GPs. And, and, and there's an expectation that will grow that GPs um, could become the instrument for LPs to decarbonize not only their own portfolios, but also the real economy, which is that elusive scope three, which effectively is about 70% uh, of the need. So we believe that those ambitious uh, GPs, um, well-placed to articulate how they can address scope three type commitments um, that the ecosystem and corporate value chain wide, you know, ecosystems are, are, are really gonna be focused on uh, could potentially be in a position to receive larger mandates and larger uh, allocations. So perhaps I think I'll just uh, stop there where my quasi Glasgow hat. <laughs> well, it's great. Thank you. It's great to have you. And sorry, I didn't realize you moved from Johannesburg to Glasgow, um, but great to have you from there. Um, I'm actually going to come back to you <clears throat> in a second on, I think, just the, the point of mobilizing the asset owners and, and what's maybe the right relationship with the MDBs. I think just to maybe echo a few of the points that my fellow panelists made. Um, I mean, one, so we are primarily an advisory firm, but we manage a couple of specialized investment vehicles um, mm -hmm. in distributed renewables, one doing commercial and industrial solar in Africa, one doing mini grids. Um, and so I think this trend towards specialization as a way to differentiate um, is, is, is a real one. I think another one is sort of dividing up sort of the operating company risk and the development company risk from the, the asset company risk. So um, we exited our, our first cross-boundary energy, which was a commercial industrial vehicle during uh, the pandemic um, at, at a 15% net IRR. So what we felt was a, a good return, but switched out of a GPLP structure into now an asset company uh, management company structure that has you know, more uh, uh, essentially unlimited runway in terms of how long we might need uh, to hold these assets. Um, I think another thing is, is, is this increased focus on the quality of the pipeline. So um, IFC calls it upstream. Um, some of the you know, development agencies might call it, call it investment facilitation. But just this idea that you do need more uh, technical transaction assistance type dollars uh, available to, to prep projects. Um, or you know, potentially on the, for some of these projects on the government side to sort of build the capacity um, of, of the counterparty to feel like they're well equipped to negotiate a fair deal. And I think on the topic, topic of fairness, there's also, you know, what is the appropriate role of subsidy? I think, you know, for example, maybe in, in rural mini grids, there hasn't been enough subsidy available to make what is, you know, fundamentally a tough economic proposition work. But then you also, you know, see situations where governments feel that they've been taken advantage of and, and sort of infrastructure owners are, are making outsized uh, returns and trying to find, you know, the right mix of, of the catalytic additional capital that, that's not uh, overly rewarding. I, in my personal view, I think you have to take you know, some, you have to accept that you might see some excess profits in order to incent some of those pioneer transactions that, that open up uh, the space. Um, yeah, so maybe leave it there for, for, for sort of the opening landscape question, but I think you know, one of the key issues is around uh, what is the appropriate role of, of the DFIs, of the MDBs in this capital, and how do we attract more institutional capital in this space. So maybe Hubert, back to you on, on that question. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, Jake. I think, look, the bottom line 
um, that we're sort of seeing and in, in, in the market is, you know, we have to look forward. And, and as you rightfully say, you know, we, um, we don't need to keep going to conferences to hear about the unbankable and uninvestable uh, pipeline when all the players have the, the, the tools and the capacity uh, to, to fix that particular uh, challenge. So the bottom line for us really is that we, you know, we feel that there needs to, we, we, we ultimately as the community need to design and deliver greater uh, public-private finance mandate alignment and then more obviously uh, catalytic private investment pathways that fast track and scale uh, private capital's participation uh, in this particular green transition as the way forward. And we think that that should actually be done through a new mechanism called uh, an institutional investor public partnership. Very similar to the way that um, the Australian successful infrastructure investors uh, you know, apply themselves and apply long-term institutional capital. They actually call it PPPs, um, pensions of public partnership. But on the continent, we're coming at this as a, a collective of uh, institutional investors, both uh, pension funds as well as sovereign funds. So we call that an institutional investor public partnership. And one of the major ones that we're leading uh, with the African Union and a group of um, African as well as global institutional investors is the African uh, Green Infrastructure Investment Bank as a platform that will really be focusing on, you know, delivering green and profitable uh, transactions as opposed to green uh, and not profitable, um, as opposed to just, you know, taking the development side. So ultimately, we just really believe that we need to design innovative platforms that can mobilize capital at scale uh, and deploy capital at speed. And it's a whole sort of new thinking and new approach as we reinvent the future um, economy uh, and, and, and address all of the sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of the transition opportunities that are there. And we really must see them as a serious opportunity. But we hear a lot from, from, from our colleagues in the LP space that, you know, there needs to be a different way to sell infrastructure risk. I mean, we're currently sort of hearing repeatedly that, you know, GPs are more, you know, uh, you know, more in line with selling developmental risks to financial investors and there seems to be that mismatch uh, so we really need to create that pathway and that alignment that i mentioned in terms of that institutional investor public partnership type model and borrow the best practice from from, from the australian and the canadian successful long-term institutional infrastructure investors i think that could work quite well considering the size and scale of the pools of capital we're, we're seeking to mobilize and the ever increasing and ballooning infrastructure deficit that we have um, that, that needs private capital on the continent. So we're basically seeing LPs um, increasingly investigate their own mandates and investment policy statements, just see in the very first instance whether they can actually you know, address infrastructure and, and which bucket that comes under and whether there's a, a regional allocation, and whether a carve out exists or, or should exist. Um, and, and, and so I think these things, are, these things are pretty important. And on the MDB side, I think that there's an opportunity uh, to really, again, build that sort of uh, bridge, if you like, in light of COVID-19 and the climate emergency, um, to basically seize the moment for this sort of wholesale review of additionality models. Um, because we need future-proof models that crowd in that not, uh, rather than crowd out private uh, capital. So we think that basically, you know, this is the time now where we can take a dual approach, you know, to, to addressing the post-pandemic economic recovery from an infrastructure standpoint, um, as well as address the transition. And we know that MDBs are mandated to take the types of risks that we can't take um, as private capital. And we think that there's some very specific things that they can do, for example, and we think asset recycling, uh, you know, a lot of infrastructure assets are held currently by, uh, you know, regional uh, development banks, uh, MDBs and development finance institutions. We think a lot of that should be recycled and refinanced and, and sold down to uh, institutional investors. And then, you know, let MDBs take that opportunity and, and, you know, reinvest those market returns in creating a secondary market for African infrastructure, which is another key and critical uh, component. And I'll just end by, just addressing this issue about we all need to work work together. And so I think the, the data is key. Um, and, and, and I think a key part of the MDB's role is to really uh, optimize their balance sheets to be able to mobilize private capital. That's part of the Hamburg principles that were undertaken and agreed to. 
um, and we know that there have been some challenges in, in you know, of course, including COVID, um, you know, that have uh, made that not as uh, fulfilling as, as everyone would have hoped. But in terms of collaboration, you know, we really need to share data. You know, we, all, we almost come from the space where we actually think data is infrastructure because it's so powerful in terms of the role that it can play to actually unlock financing. So we know that the, the, the GEMS database is a major issue for us, uh, uh, you know, because institutional investors really need the same clarity and transparency of data that MDBs have. And the MDBs have this database called the GEMS database, which basically brings together all of the historic performance of project finance, loans and infrastructure financings. And that data is only available to the MDBs. So we think that that data should be democratized and we think if that data becomes more freely and transparently available to institutional capital, we'll see a lot more uh, investment flow. And that's a case that's been proven by the African Development Bank's $1.2 billion room to run program, the securitization, where on a special case basis, that data, the GEMS data was made available to pension funds and they closed that transaction with record, uh, record levels of participation uh, from institutional capital. So I think the tools are there, the opportunity and the incentive is there. Um, I just think we need to reinvent not only the market um, that we need in terms of new transactions, but we need to understand that if, if the market is going to transform and change so dramatically, so must our own institutions and our policies and our practices and our approaches. Um, and I think it's got to be focused on being able to mobilize capital at scale and to be able to create an enabling legal and regulatory environment that enables us not to have to wait 10 years or eight or five or seven years for a project to reach financial close. Therefore, we have to create a, an environment where we can deploy capital uh, at speed. And, 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 and this is something that institutional investors are very clear on. They say, if you want to see more private capital coming to the continent, then let's see more projects reach financial close at a greater pace. And then we can have a lot more confidence in the asset class. So perhaps I'll leave it there. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. A lot there. And I'm going to have to come to you, Ryan, because I think a lot of that, there is a lot of reference to sort of the, the DFI landscape there and this tension between the DFI as an investor and obviously trying to step in to fill a gap when maybe some investors have stepped back, but the DFI as a, as a mobilizer or enabler of capital, the right bridge to institutional capital, the role of creating a secondary market of perhaps offloading some of your now brownfield exposure to um, institutional investors. So I guess welcome your yeah. comments and thoughts on that. Well, thanks. Um, I think Hubert touched on quite a bit there. Um, and I think the collaboration or cooperation amongst investors is really something that needs to happen more than it has in the past. I think DFIs and multilaterals have had this notion that they, you put money into an investment, you make it seem attractive that you're validating it, and hopefully others come around and, and invest as well. And this is true in, in terms of funds, this is true in terms of you know, particular areas or themes in the market. And I think that notion of trying to demonstrate that commercial returns can be had it hasn't really come through and it takes too long to demonstrate even if it can be demonstrated. So I think this idea that DFIs can play a role linking the public markets or the um, public sector to private markets it just needs to happen a bit more fluidly and there's a lot of programs and a lot of things that are going on that just aren't really linked and I think DFIs can play a better role in trying to link those. Um, for example at COP, CDC is announcing this partnership with Rockefeller Foundation called Global Energy Alliance and it's for mini grids CNI primarily focused on Nigeria and DRC so the intent there is to use uh, concessional capital or risk capital that DFIs can, can really take or foundations or impact investors can really take to try to mobilize a billion into those uh, particular niche markets. So it, it's something like that that we think is really needed much more in scale to, to get private capital to work and to kind of do it all in unison or um, a bit more designed to, to really be fluid and to, to really work together. Yeah, and I, I guess I guess in those projects, is there, you know, is there is there how how directly will CDC will CDC be, you know, the the fund manager, so to speak, the developer in some certain cases, or will it be investing through other GPs? I think probably it'll mainly be. I mean, this is new. This is this is just announced and developed 
Rockefeller is leading this. Yeah. But I think it will be in a number of different areas. Um, I think it will be through funds and fund managers. It will be uh, perhaps on the, um, on the lending side. I think we can lend uh, yeah, an attractive um, sort of concessional rates. We don't want to distort the market, but I think we can offer something there that, that helps to get projects underway. Um, I think in some of these markets, it will take kind of niche specialists at the point earlier made. I think we'll, we, we will rely on local developers and people that have knowledge in the markets. And I think some of this we really, as a BFI, can't do on our own, so we will rely on, um, on others. Great. Uh, Jake, Murray, I know I you spent a lot of time thinking about how to sort of change the risk return uh, balance or calculation for institutional capital. So thoughts on that and what Hubert said earlier? Yeah, um, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to echo a lot of what's been, been said already, but um, in terms of sort of how, how do you shift that, that risk return calculation for, for investors and, and especially if you're trying to bring new investors in, into the continent. I think one is um, what we've, we've spoken before is how, how do you bring de-risking mechanisms and guarantees to change that, that, that risk return perception, right? So um, guarantees won't make a, a, a bad project a good project, but they are going to uh, have that catalytic role in terms of changing the risk perception, reducing the cost for the issuer, um, and attracting new pools of capital. So it's thinking a little bit like a, a, a recipe book for, for someone who never cooked before or someone who's um, cooking a complex meal. If you're doing it for the first time, you're going to need that book, and then uh, afterwards you, you can do it uh, without it, uh, and you can add spice, and you can start innovating. Um, and then the second one is, is TA, so technical assistance. I don't, um, as I said, I mean, a, a guarantee won't make a, a, a bad project a good project. And, and to, to the point before, earlier, um, how, do you, how do you improve the investability of that project? You, 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 you might need sort of a, yeah, that technical assistance to, to come in and, and help improve um, bankability, but also link those projects to to the investors that are out there, to, to Rupert's point. Um, and then the third is, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, the data point, I think, is, is a great one in terms, of, in terms of bringing those investors in. And um, we've been doing some, some work in the credit rating space in, in, in the continent, and essentially looking at, um, is there a potential um, is there room for, for improvements in how global credit rating agencies are assessing risk in the continent? And uh, just as, as a data point, there are currently 32 sovereigns um, rated in the continent. More than half of them, 18, are single B rated. So if you're, if you're a first time investor in the, in, in the continent and you're looking into uh, 18 that are 18 countries that are the same. How do you how do you differentiate, right? So, um, to to the to the cooking point again. If you if you have if you're cooking for the first, you never cooked rice before, so you're looking at basmati and, and long grain. What's what's the difference, right? So, how do you improve that granularity, um, that data granularity, and both in terms of is there a role for, is, is, there, is there potential for rating agencies to become better at assessing that risk, but then also how do you bring local, local actors or, or regional credit rating agencies that are in the continent um, to provide that data, because they have it, right? So how do you, how, how do you um, make that data get to, get, to the, get to the investors? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, and I think there is a role probably for multilaterals in sort of unlocking some of that data and being an honest broker that can push for the release of, of that, some of that data. Um, <clears throat> so just to come to you, I think, I mean, a lot of the implied conversation has been around, I think probably, you know, we're mostly thinking ahead of like sort of energy infrastructure projects, transport projects. But I think, you know, COVID has revealed this dimension of uh, health and the social infrastructure as very much infrastructure as well. And I know that's an area where you've invested. So maybe comment on like the full spectrum of infrastructure. Um, as well. No, absolutely. Um, and healthcare has been kind of a key focus for us. I think 40 plus percent of our portfolio is healthcare, um, from uh, manufacturing down to distribution and retail as well. <clears throat> so we understand that space, and in some cases, we have mitigated those risks through guarantees, etc. But one of the things that we've identified is that uh, Hubert mentioned is that asset churn. 
That doesn't really happen. Um, so banks would sit on an asset that is not performing, they'll just hold it on their books, not provision for it, and just find ways of kind of delaying that. Uh, and we're finding ways of taking those assets off their balance sheets into another vehicle, for example, um, and trying to kind of recapitalize it and at least bring it back into, um, um, you know, breathe life back into that uh, asset or project, be it healthcare, be it education, uh, be, be it kind of uh, average infrastructure projects like um, um, energy or, or even logistics. So that's an area. And then the other thing that we've looked at is um, dollars going into the country can sometimes be a detriment to infrastructure projects. One, the yield's not going to be that high. How, are, um, how is dollarized return going to be achieved? Um, so then partnering with local asset managers, um, kind of galvanizing that capital that is available in the infrastructure space or available for the infrastructure space, uh, which happens to be in the kind of pension administrators uh, kind of realm. Um, so why don't you leverage that and kind of get that out into the private sector? So again, we're, there's a partnership that we're developing in Nigeria for that local currency infrastructure. And that infrastructure definition uh, for pension administrators is very wide. Uh, so you can do anything from payment rails platform to a, a, a telco or rural telephony project. So it's very, very wide, uh, including healthcare, et cetera. So if I, I think this is kind of an evolution of this industry, uh, and then if this asset chain kind of gets mobilized, uh, it'll be private capital, it'll be uh, institutional capital, it'll be kind of multilaterals themselves. There's churn in the industry, um, so if private capital takes over, then they've got a secondary market to sell that asset down into. So developing that secondary is, I think, a big problem for PEs, but also for infrastructure managers. So um, <coughs> at some point, um, that market needs to be mobilized and kind of added capital into. Whether that's DFIs or uh, institutional capital, I think that debate kind of continues, uh, but that needs to happen. Um, and if you look at projects that sometimes don't get um, funding are very kind of social impactful projects, like education projects. There's a, um, there's a um, um, school um, operator out of South Africa that is now in Kenya and Tanzania, uh, but can't mobilize that much capital. It's got 13 institutions, uh, but funny enough, DFIs tend to shy away from um, school projects or education projects because of the detriment associated with them or the damage that it could cause. So again, that kind of treading on eggshells needs to be looked, or looked at a little bit and frowned less upon to mobilize capital because what is worse, um, that uh, education project going under, which means over 3,000 students not having a school to go to, or whether they're being a slight, you know, kind of in the news, you know, kind of situation, which is worse uh, which is a worse evil, I guess, is the question. So that's kind of my, my kind of uh, value add here or my kind of perception that across the spectrum, look at, look at whatever aspect of the infrastructure, there is that mobilization, the depth of that market that needs to be created. And without that, unfortunately, we'll see the demise of uh, GPs at the rate that we're seeing in, uh, in private equity. Um, so I think we collectively as a, uh, as a capital body, be it institutional, be it DFIs, be it private, just need to uh, come together. And Hubert mentioned this, and perhaps I did as well. So I think, in, th in my view, that's really the need of the hour. Yeah, I think to the, I mean, there's a need perhaps for, to, to, for some openness to, to, to restructuring, to rethinking. There are a number of zombie funds or projects out there, perhaps that, you know, and that was tolerated during the pandemic period because it, you know, you wanted to give things a chance. But I think there is a need to, to to be realistic and also create space for new entrants to come in for like that sort of creative destruction from which then can emerge new projects. Um, uh, I think I think we're out of time. I see uh, <laughs> um, we have the next panel ready uh, in the back, but so hopefully we can engage in in some of the sidebars. This is an exciting new event, and then <laughs> it's been just Zoom for the last two years, and now we can actually have some of the coffee chats that we've missed. Um, but thanks very much for your time and attention, and please join me in thanking our panel.